All right, good morning. Welcome to the beginning of week four. So we're, we're at the halfway mark now. Uh, week seven will be devoted to your uh, group presentations. So I will not be doing lecturing during week seven. You will be doing lecturing during week seven. Um, last week, we took a look at the NumPy library that allows you to, or module, that allows you to manipulate arrays of uh, values. And this week, we're going to take a look at pandas, which allows you to create uh, indexed sequences of values, uh, such as things like time series, which is sort of uh, one-dimensional, or uh, spreadsheet-like uh, data collections. If you've done a little bit of R, you'll be familiar with the idea of a data frame in R. And that is a concept that pandas directly stole. Uh, so we have, pan we have data frames in pandas that allow you to represent uh, tabular indexed information. All right, so there are two primary data types that pandas provides. One is the series, which is things like time series, and the other is the data frame. A series is one-dimensional. And it's a sequence of values that all have to have the same data type. There is an index associated with that series. And the values in the index are referred to as the uh, labels for the values in the series. Now, here we're creating a pandas series from a list that is from an iterable. In this case, the values in the series are going to just be the integer values, the Python integer values, 3, 5, 2, 4. Now, internally, actually, pandas uses NumPy to store this stuff. So these... <laughs> Since pandas and Python both start with P, I have a tendency to say one when I mean the other, so I'm trying to be careful here. So the, the Python ints are actually being stored in pandas as NumPy int32s. Okay, easy for me to say. Um, let me import NumPy as NP, and I will also import pandas as PD so that I have my usual abbreviations available for these modules. Pandas is even bigger than NumPy. Any day now it will be loaded. I think. <laughs> All right, clearly I need to upgrade my laptop. Come on, come on. There we go. And so now if I say S1 gets PD dot series from this list of values, 3524. And I display S1. We see the labels, the, the index labels, in the left column, and the actual values associated with those labels in the right-hand column. And I get told here that the data type of these values is uh, in 64. Now, now, this is sort of interesting to me, because um, although uh, pandas does use NumPy uh, to store values. For whatever reason, it's choosing to use the int64 data type rather than the default int32 data type. So values that you store in a pandas series can range between uh, roughly plus and minus nine uh, quintillion rather than plus and minus two billion as they can for an int32. Okay, now in that series that I've created, I can request to see just the values or just the index. So s1.values is this ND array uh, showing the values and the fact that the data type of these values is uh, in 64. s1.index is something called 
the range index uh, function. So range index within pandas is very similar to the just plain range function that we use at the Python uh, uh, top level. It has, just like the range function does, uh, a starting point, a stopping point, which is actually one beyond the last value, uh, and a step size. All right, so if you don't specify a particular index, you get a range index by default going from zero up to uh, n minus one, where n is the number of items in the series. In this next case, I'm creating a pandas series called S2 in which I have specified a specific index rather than taking the default. All right, so let's do that one. S2 gets pd.series, and I'll have my iterable containing the values, 4215 in this case. Whoops. And then I specify my index with the keyword argument index and a list of the indexes that I want. Now, in this case, I actually want to use strings as indexes rather than integers as indexes. So I'm saying uh, little a is the index of the first element, little x is the index of the second element, capital C is the index of the third element. And there's no requirement that these strings be letters. So here I'm using a question mark as my last index. And so now I have the series S2. And you can see the indexes in the left column and the corresponding values in the right. Now, in the case of S1, I have integers as indices. So if I say S1 sub 2, I'm accessing the element whose index is 2. And that gives me back a value of 2. Or if I say S1 sub 0, that gets me back the value 3 and so on. In the case of S2, I can use these uh, strings as indexes. I can say S2 sub question mark to get back the 5, or S2 sub A to get back the 4. But it turns out that you can also use integer indexes as well. So the integer indexes are always available from 0 up through n minus 1, regardless of whether you've chosen integers as your default indexes or uh, you've chosen something like strings. So uh, if I say S2 sub 2, that's actually going to get me this value, right? So S2 sub 0 would be a 4. S2 sub 2 is going to be the value 1. So far, so good? Yes. I'm wondering, can we do the same for columns rather than rows? Uh, uh, okay, so a series is one We don't yet have a concept of columns and rows. All we have right now is a sequence of labeled values. When we get to data frames, then we will have uh, rows and columns. Other questions so far? All right. OK. OK, so I guess uh, I just I, I, I guess I just said basically what's on slide four. I think I did not show you uh, just the values of s two or just the index of S2, but there they are. Now, because <clears throat> a series is like a, a sequence of pairs of values, that is, a label and a corresponding value, we already have something sort of like that. We have dictionaries, which are keys and associated values. And the keys in a dictionary have to be unique. So it makes sense that we should be able to create a series from a dictionary, and we can. So what I have here are uh, ticker symbols that you'd, uh, you know, if you watch CNBC or whatever, you'd see these ticker symbols. And the values here are the corresponding prices uh, at a given moment in time for these 
uh, for these particular stocks. <clears throat> now I'm too lazy to manually type that in. I'll make too many mistakes. So I have uh, actually put this <clears throat> specification for D1 into a file. And let me copy and paste that. All right, so D1 is going to be my dictionary. Uh, I'm using curly braces with the, the colon notation to separate the key from the value. I've got three items in this dictionary. And poof, there we have it. So help. <laughs> help, literally, I didn't want help, but I got it. <laughs> um, OK, so, so x uh, is my nod to. Uh, Pittsburgh, that's the ticker for U.S. Steel. Um, and then, of course, we have Apple and Cisco Systems. We have a very small portfolio, apparently. I can build a series directly from that dictionary, and the tickers will be treated as the labels with the prices as the values. So here I'm saying S3 gets pd.series. D1, and there we are. Now, as I was typing that, I realized that I didn't say so, but series does have a capital S. You have to type the capital S to create a series object. All right. Yes? So, so, question. so does that mean that index could also have these values? Because if you're using stocks in this case, then it's possible that your stocks could have the same face value, right? And if you're using the strings of index, could, are the case sensitive? So values can certainly be the same. Um, it is true that on a you know, at a given moment in time, uh, you could have many different stocks that happen to have the same price at that moment in time. Um, uh, you are allowed, it turns out, to have uh, at least in a uh, data frame, you're allowed to have multiple labels that are the same. Um, let me catch up to that, though, if you don't mind. Other things? Okay. All right. So we used the in keyword previously to find out whether some value was in a set. We can also use the in keyword to find out whether a particular ticker, whether a particular label is in a series. Okay, so x in, C in S3 returns true. Um, MSFT in S3 returns false. I don't happen to have a a price at this moment for Microsoft in the in my dictionary or in my series. Now you can do vector oriented arithmetic and slicing and subscripting in a series just like you can within an ND array. So let's go through various examples to illustrate this. Alright, so whoops. So here is my S1 again. And if I say S1 times gets 2, the index labels are unaffected by this. But the values in S1, each value is going to be doubled. And consequently, when I look at S1 afterward, uh, instead of 3, 5, 2, 4, I have 6, 10, 4, 8 now. And notice that the data type didn't change because there were int 64s in the series, and I multiplied by ints, so I got back int 64s. But if I do a division, remember that in Python, division always gives you a float, and that's still the case for a series in, Py uh, in pandas. Here I'm creating a brand new series, S4, by taking S. 1 and dividing by 2. So each value gets divided by 2. Now, 
it turns out the values in S1 are evenly divisible by 2. So the fractions are all going to be 0. But nevertheless, each of these values in S4 is a, a float 64 rather than an integer, even though the fractions are 0. Make sense? OK. Floor division of an integer by an integer does give you back an integer. Now, S1, S4 contains float 64s, but S1 contains int values. So if I say S1 floor divide gets 2, uh, a floor division of an int by an int still gives you an int. And so that gets S1 back to containing its original sequence of values, 3, 5, 2, 4. <clears throat> All right, so S1 plus S1 just does a vector sort of addition. You end up, since, since the series of labels are identical for S1 and itself, <laughs> the result has the same sequence of labels, but the values are the sums of the values of each copy of S1. All right, so the labels are still 0, 1, 2, 3, but the values of that result are 6, 10, 4, 8. Now, uh, I don't have an assignment going on in what I just did there. So S1 has not actually been changed. But if I had said S1 gets S1 plus S1, that would have modified S1. Well, no, this, you know, because this is Python, it would have modified the reference S1 to refer to the new series that's the sum of the old S1s. <laughs> okay. All right, so slicing does what we would expect. Uh, here's S1, here's S1, uh, colon 2, whoop, sub, colon 2. That gives me everything up to but not including item sub 2. Or for S2, I'm sorry, S3. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, OK. Now, slicing uses integer uh, subscripts, not a, I'm sorry, let me unwind a little bit. S1 has integer indices, integer labels. And so it's natural for us to ask for a slice using the integer uh, sequences, the integer slices. Turns out we can do the same thing for a series that has strings or floats or some other kind of label uh, by nevertheless using integer subscripts. So, if, so when I said S1 sub colon 2, that meant everything up to but not including sub 2. The same thing is true if I say S2 sub colon 2. Remember that we can use integer subscripts in a series that has labels that are not integers, and that will work. So here I'm going to get sub 0, which is the label A with value 4, and sub 1, label X and value 2, and that's it. And similarly for S3, uh, but let me use a slice in a different direction now. Let me say from uh, 1 colon, just for a change of pace, that's going to give me, uh, whoop. <laughs> I wanted to highlight, not change my window. All right, so that's going to give me from item sub 1, which is Apple, to the end. And the last one in here happens to be Cisco. So everybody happy so far? So slicing looks like usual. If the series does have non-integer labels, like S2 and S3 in our case, you can use the non-integer labels in a slice. But the meaning changes now, because the meaning of this slice means up to and including the final labeled value. OK, so if I say s3 sub x colon aapl, 
When we did this with integer subscripts, we expected that to mean something like x up to but not including alpha. But for nine integer subscripts, it actually means from x up to and including apple. Okay, or S3 sub uh, apple up to and including Cisco. All right. Now, when we did things like addition of two series, we were looking at two series that had the same labels. So that the sum of those two series also had the same labels. But it's possible that the labels or the indexes will not be the same uh, between two different series. And if you then combine these things together with addition and multiplication or what have you, the places where the labels don't match up will get filled in with these so-called not a number uh, values. Uh, in statistical terms, you can think of not a number as representing uh, a missing value from your, uh, from your data. All right, so what I'm doing here is creating uh, a new series S6 containing three values. Now, this is too long for me to type, so I'm going to copy and paste it. Here we go. I mean, I can type it, but I'll probably make 14 mistakes. <laughs> All right, so S6 is a series in which the values are going to be 3, 7, and 1, and the index is going to be this range index uh, starting from 2, going up to but not including 5, and the default step size is 1. So the indexes are going to be 2, 3, and 4 for these three values, 3, 7, and 1. Okay? Let's confirm that. Okay, so my indexes are 2, 3, and 4 for these values, 3, 7, and 1. Now, S1 has different indexes. Between the two of them, they have index 3. Uh, I'm sorry, they have index 2 in common, and they have index 3 in common. So if I add these guys up and say S1 plus S6, okay, well, only S1 has an index 0. So S1 plus S6 for index 0 is going to be not a number because we don't have a subscript 0 in S6. Yes? I'm wondering uh, on the previous uh, line, uh, why did we have to use range index instead of range? Um, it parses it as a, as a... Okay, excellent question. Why did we have to use range index? We don't have to. Um, range index is a built-in facility within pandas, so it's convenient to use. But we could have used something like a comprehension to generate um, a sequence of uh, subscripts. Let, let me finish the addition and then we'll back up to that if that's okay. Okay, so, so S1 and S6 don't have label 0 in common and they don't have label 1 in common and they don't have label 4 in common. So the sum is going to have labels 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 but the 0 and 1 sum is going to be not a number. And the 4 sum is going to be not a number. I'm only going to get values for indexes 2 and 3 that are in common between these series. OK? OK, let me back up for a moment uh, to talk about this range index thing. Let me create uh, S. Uh, SI, S index, as PD dot series uh, square bracket four three seven, and then I can say index equals, um, and I can use any iterable that produces an index. Range index is is a built-in thing within pandas, so it's convenient to use. But I could just as well say 
Um, I for I in range five if I mod two equals one. That's not going to work. Zero. Um, the, the, okay, why can't we just say range? Um, because range is, okay, the, the, the deal here is that the, the labels have to be an object. Range is an iterable, it's not an object. Range index does give you an object that has characteristics. So I can use an object like uh, 432, that's a list object, but now we may discover that I'm wrong. This has happened before. <laughs> if I say uh, 5, 3, 1 as my values, and then I say index equals range 3. Well, let's say range 2, comma 5. So 2, 3, 4. I am wrong! Cool! Interesting. So, uh, so internally, for whatever reason, um, pandas decided to convert my use of range internally into range index. I have no idea why. Now we're now we're you know, since since I was wrong, trying to explain the details of my wrongness is a little beyond me. <laughs> um, okay. Any other questions? Okay, so we're, we're looking at arithmetic. We've got S1, we've got S6, and they have some overlapping indexes, but they're not exactly the same. So when I add them together, the result will have all of the indexes, but for the, for the ones that are unique to one series or the other, my, I get not a numbers as my sum. Okay. I can detect... whether a value is a number or not a number uh, using a test called is null. Um, I, I guess I want to save this sum uh, into a series referred to by this sorry alright I promise someday I will remember <laughs> to turn off my dog food alarm. <laughs> Alright, so let me create this variable. S1P6 is S1 plus S6. There's S1P6. And if I say S1P6 dot is null. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. No, that's a... Okay pd dot is null s1 p6 gives me back a series of boolean values it turns out you can also say is nah i think or is it is yeah is not nah. not nah, <laughs> this one doesn't make a lot of sense to me <laughs> Um, <laughs> S1P6, the values in here are either valid values or they're not a number, N -A N. But for some reason, you can ask whether 
they are null or you can ask whether they are na and a but you can't ask whether there is nan <laughs> I don't think that exists uh, are we going to discover my second error of the day here no yay <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so not a number can be thought of either as null or not available, uh, NA, uh, depending on your preference. Okay, now, as we talked about with ND arrays last week, you can use a Boolean series as an index uh, into a series to get out just the particular uh, labels that you want. All right, so uh, pd dot is null of s one p six shows me true where the where there are not valid numbers shouldn't be a huge surprise to discover that pd dot not null is the opposite of this so if i ask for pd sub pd dot not i'm sorry if i ask for s1 p6 sub pd dot not null s1 p6 okay this is a Boolean index, and what it's going to do is get for me just the values in the series where not null is true. In other words, in you know, in statistical data analysis terms, this is this is getting for for me the subset of the values th that are valid values, and that are and, that are <laughs> that are not not a number. <laughs> All right, so uh, any questions at this point? So a series combines values with an index. The values are stored in an ND array. The index can be either a sequence of integer values or it can be a sequence of arbitrary values like strings and uh, floats or, or whatever. And you can do uh, slicing and subscripting and arithmetic and so forth um, on these series. Next, we're going to take a look at data frames, which are two-dimensional uh, variations on series here. Basically, a data frame you can think of as being like a spreadsheet, where each row has some kind of label, and then each column has some kind of sequence of values. Each column has its own data type. It's not necessary for the different columns to have the same data type. So you can have one column that's strings, another column that's booleans, another column that's integers, another column that's floating point numbers, just like you would in an actual, you know, like Excel uh, spreadsheet. Now, an easy way to create a data frame is from a dictionary. And in this case, the key I want to think of as being the, uh, the column label. Okay, so the key is the column label, and then I have some iterable containing all of the values for that column. So here I'm creating three columns, ticker, uh, CEO by, and return percent. Notice that the ticker column is strings, the CEO by is booleans, either true or false, and the return percent is floating point values. I'm much too lazy to spend the time typing that in without mistakes, so let me copy and paste that guy. Okay, so here's D2. D2 is a dictionary at this point. Okay, so the, so the ticker is associated with this list, strings, A, B, X, G. 
the tick, uh, the, uh, the, the CEO buy is associated with this list of bools, true, false, false, false. And then we have return percent with this list of uh, floating point values. What does this represent? Well, um, <clears throat> if you're interested in investing, one of the things that you look for is um, attributes of companies or attributes of stock that stocks that, that might give you some information as to whether the stock is likely to increase in value or decrease in value. And some of the attributes that people look at are, uh, is the CEO currently buying the stock? You know, if the CEO is currently buying the stock, maybe that's an indication that, that the stock price ought to be rising. And so maybe it would be a good opportunity for you to get on board and, and buy the stock. Or another thing that we typically look at is the uh, percentage return on the stock. Um, uh, you know, how, how much uh, has the uh, stock price risen over the course of the last year? And, and these are just two of a myriad of attributes that people are interested in, like um, what is the price earnings ratio? That is, what's the price of the stock compared to the earnings that you can get from the stock? Uh, what is the price earnings to growth ratio? That is, what's the PE ratio relative to how fast the company is growing? And on and on and on. There's all these, you know, attributes and attributes. Now, the ticker, we'll assume, is not an indicator <laughs> of whether the uh, price is likely to go up or down. Uh, we don't think the name of the company matters much. But nevertheless, we want to be able to tell from looking at our table which, which company we're talking about. So let us create from this thing a series, sorry, a data frame called F1. F1, come on, F1 is a pandas data frame built from this dictionary. There we go. Um, so now we see that what were the uh, keys in the dictionary are the column names. And what were the values in the dictionary are the values for each column. And we get the default labels, 0 through n minus 1, where n is the number of uh, values in each of the iterables associated with, with the keys. This is the kind of data that you would like to be able to feed into a machine learning algorithm to see whether you can detect, well, you know, how good a predictor is CEO by? How good a predictor is return percent? How good a predictor is peg ratio? How good a predictor are, you know, XYZ um, attributes? So ideally, we would like to have, you know, thousands of stocks and a couple of dozen attributes to check <laughs> Uh, to, to see whether we can figure out which ones of these uh, companies is the best bet. All right, so now that we have this data frame, we need to know how to be able to get data out of the data frame that we are interested in. One way of getting data out of the data frame is to ask for just a particular column. And you can do that by specifying the column's name as an index, f1 sub. And the column names here are going to be strings. So CEO by f1 sub CEO by gets me a series for that particular column of the data frame. Uh, f1 sub return underscore percent gives me that particular column and so forth. Now, you'll notice that when I ask for a particular column, what I'm getting out is actually a series. Let, let's prove that. Let's prove that. So F1 sub C, CEO by I want to know what the type of this thing is. 
I claim that it is a Pandas series, and it is, okay, so F1 sub CEO by is a Pandas series, and notice that when I ask for uh, F1.CEO by, I get a name for the series. Previously, with our series like S1, we didn't have a name. We, we had a data type, but we didn't have a name value. Well, you can establish the name for any series that you want or, or change the name of the series by just assigning a string to the, the dot name attribute. All right, so S1 does not have a name, but I can easily say S1.name gets uh, I am series S1. And now S1 does have a name, all right? <laughs> so the name is just, is just an attribute that a series may or may not have. You can also, as a shortcut, use the column name following a dot rather than in, inside the score brackets. And this is just a little bit simpler. So instead of F1 sub quote CEO by close quote square brackets, I can just say F1 dot CEO by. And that will also work. Gives me the same thing. However, that's more restricted because what if the name has something in it like spaces or asterisks or slashes or percent signs? If I say f1 dot return underscore percent, well, Python is going to get upset with me because it thinks that the percent sign is the uh, is the uh, the modulus operator, and so I'm going to get an error from this, saying you know that's not valid syntax. So if you care about such things, if you care about such conveniences, then you may choose uh, column names that are valid identifiers that don't have things in them uh, like spaces or punctuation uh, symbols. In other words, choose column names that s start with a letter followed by, well, start with a letter or underscore followed by letters, digits, and underscores. All right? That will work. If you want to see? Then you have to use the uh, square brackets. So you can't use just the dot, but you can always use the square brackets and put quotes around return percent. Yes, good point. I should have shown that. <laughs> Other questions? OK, very good. OK, so you can always use the subscript notation and put quotes around your column name. Um, so you, you, you can have things like spaces and stars and uh, slashes in your column names uh, if you want, and you can still get access to them. All right, so what we've shown you so far is how to get certain columns out of this data frame. And you do that using the column name. But how do you get certain rows out of the data frame? OK, well, Wes McKinney is the guy who developed this, so this is his fault. It's not my fault. To get a row, you have to use the word, well, sorry, there's, there's other ways. But to get a row, you typically use the, uh, the, the attribute dot loc, loc for location. Although why a row is a location and a column is not is not obvious to me at all. Um, but here, if I say f1 dot loc sub 1, sorry, sub 1, I'm going to get this row from the data frame. 
that row will be presented to me as a series, which means, whoops, which means because in a series, the values have to go in an ND array. Here we have a string, a Boolean, and a float. Remember the business of upcasting in order to make all of these things fit into an ND array. NumPy looks at these values and says, oh, I give up. I don't know what to do with these. So it just says, all right, these guys are all objects. <laughs> the data type, the common data type in this, in this uh, row is object. And the name, the label for this series is one. Okay, so we've taken a look, given our data frame, F1 here, we've taken a look at how to extract a column. You do that by giving the column name in square brackets. We've also seen how to extract a particular row. You do that by using dot loc and then the label for the row in square brackets. Finally, how do we access just a particular cell? within this data frame. Um, Pandas is so nice to us that it gives us three different ways of, of doing that. First of all, we can extract, well, let, let's suppose that I want to get this <coughs> cell, the cell containing the X. Um, well, the first thing I could do is to extract the ticker column All right, so the ticker column is a series. And within the series, I can ask for the row whose label is two, and that will get me that cell, All right? So I ask for the column, and then I ask for a particular row. I can go the other direction. I can ask for a particular row, and here I need to remember to use dot loc, and <clears throat> then uh, if I ask for a particular row, the column names become the labels, so then I ask for a particular label, and that also gets me that particular cell. Finally, the most common approach is to just use row comma column notation. And so I ask for row two comma ticker. No, I gotta for, I gotta say dot loc. Yep, <laughs> it makes me angry that I have to say dot loc, so I forget at least once a day. F one dot ah, <laughs> dratted help. Okay, F one dot loc, uh, two comma, and then the column. Whoops, comma. Ah, well, it doesn't matter. I type square brackets so I can just keep going. And then my closing square bracket. Yay, and so I got the, the particular cell that I wanted that way. Okay, so here on slide 21 summarizes those three different approaches. I can ask for a column first, and then from within that column, a particular row. Or I can ask for a row first using dot loc, and from within that row, a particular column. Or I can use the dot loc and specify row comma column name. And that gets me a, each of those, that each of those notations gets me to the same specific cell in the data frame. Questions so far? Okay, so we've 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 been able to get a row. Uh, <laughs> we've been able to get a column. We've been able to get a row, and we've been able to get a cell. Now, of course, we have to worry about slices. How do I get slices of columns, slices of rows, slices of cells? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I I jumped the gun. Um, all right. We know how to get a column, a row, and a value. Now we want to know how to add or change columns, rows, and values. So adding and changing is what we're going to take a look at next. To add a column, 
into a data frame turns out to be uh, fairly straightforward. Here is my existing F1. Let's suppose that I want another column for my machine learning algorithm, which is the uh, PE ratio for the stock. All right, so F1 sub PE, where PE P slash E is a string, would, would return to me a column if that column existed. But in this case, it's going to create a column, and I'm going to assign values for those uh, for each of the rows. If I use a scalar, 20.5, let's say, then each row is going to get filled in with that scalar. So I have now added a column to F1 where I've specified, okay, the PE ratio for each one of these stocks is 20.5. The specific values don't matter that much. Uh, historically speaking, when the price of a stock gets to be more than 20, what its earnings are, on average, it's considered that stocks are pretty expensive when that's the case. You, you really like to see P.E. ratios around, around 10 or so. Uh, that means that the market is perhaps undervalued. But here I'm saying, all right, the P.E. ratio for all four of these stocks happens to be exactly the same value. If I want to also add, let's say, the PEG ratio, this is the price earnings to growth ratio. In this instance, I'm specifying different values for each one of the rows by using an iterable that's the same length as the number of rows in my data frame. All right, so I guess we're going to call this peg ratio. And, oops, that's not what I wanted. Uh, and I'm going to specify different values. Okay, 1 1.7, 1.7, 0.9, 2.2, 1.1. 1 .1. Were any of you alive in 1990? <laughs> At the end of the first uh, tech bubble. <laughs> well, actually, it was probably like the third tech bubble. Um, there are tech bubbles all the time. Uh, this was the first um, PC-related uh, tech bubble uh, when the, uh, the NASDAQ index uh, doubled in value over the course of, the, of one year. It, it went up 99% in one year. And then two months later, <laughs> slammed to the ground. And in that environment, what people are really interested in is uh, price earnings to growth ratios. And you can make an argument, well, you know, the PE ratio on Cisco Systems is 40. 40? I mean, 20 is considered to be kind of high. 40? What does that, what does 40 mean? Well, it means that if you as a stockholder were actually receiving a check for the earnings, for the corporate earnings, you would have to wait for 40 years to get paid back for what you spent for that share of stock. I mean, my goodness, you're a lot better off, you know, giving people 30-year mortgages for, for that kind of, uh, than, than investing in Cisco Systems. But people were saying, oh, but the peg ratio, the peg ratio is five. That, it's going so fast, it's going to catch up with that. And, you know, three years from now, the P.E. ratio is going to be single digits. And that was true for several years, and then it wasn't. <laughs> and, and I personally had the, the, the pleasure. Uh, I, I, I will remember this for the rest of my life. Um, Cisco Systems got up to $120 a share, and this was in 1989. So this was... This was 30 years ago that it was at a, a, what did I say, $140 or something like that? Well, I knew that Cisco was a great company, so 
I waited until it went down to forty dollars, and then I bought a whole bunch of it, and then it went down to eight. <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't lose 95% of my money. I only lost 85%. <laughs> 80%. Only 80%. Only 80%. Not 95%. That was a, that was a lesson. <laughs> so people still look at peg ratios to see whether investments are likely to be a good thing or not. And you want to see higher peg ratios. The higher peg ratio, the better. But you also have to have some, you know, some other evidence that you know, maybe there's a maybe there's a good reason for that peg ratio other than people just being uh, stupid. All right. Um, anyway, so so we've seen now how I can create I, I can create a new column in a data frame and set all of the row values to a scalar, or I can create a new column in a data frame and set individual values for uh, each one of the rows. Now, as far as getting rid of a column, I use the del keyword with a particular subscript, a uh, column name, p slash e, let's say. All right, so I decide, well, all right, I have this PE ratio in my, in my data, but I, I decide I don't really want it. So I can say delete f1 sub and then string pe and now that whole column is gone. Okay? To get rid of a row, I, I'm sorry. All right, so we saw how to add a column and how to get rid of a column. Now we want to take a look at how to add a row and how to get rid of a row. You add a row by using the dot loc thing with a new label. Okay, so my existing labels are 0, 1, 2, 3. If I say f1 sub uh, <laughs> dot loc <laughs> sub 4 equals, <clears throat> now I can specify uh, values uh, corresponding to the four uh, columns. So let's have a ticker of uh, C and a CEO buy of true and a return percent of 12.75 and a peg ratio of 1.7. There we go. So now I have added another row uh, to my data frame. Question? So the encoded data doesn't have to be consistent with the data types, right? Um, I was careful in this case to make sure that the values I'm putting in match the data type of the existing values. I, I was careful to do that because if I don't do that, then things go, things get wrecked because of upcasting, and I'm about to show that example. All right, so so that worked fine. I added a row with label four, uh, with an appropriate ticker, an appropriate CEO buy value, and appropriate return percent and peg ratios. But suppose that I do something that doesn't really make sense. All right, so I want to I want to uh, avoid messing up my F1 data frame. So I'm going to create a new data frame called F1C as a copy of F1. All right, so at this moment, F1C is a completely separate copy of F1 with the same columns, the same rows, and the same values. Now, if I do something stupid, like saying F1C sub 0.5 gets 12, um, you can assign a scalar to all of the columns of F1, and you can use a floating point number as a, as a label rather than an int, but all of the columns, including the label column, are now going to be upcast. So what will happen is that these labels, whoops, these labels, which had been integers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, are going to be upcast to floating point values, 0, 0 1.0, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. The ticker um, 
is, is okay. We're just going to represent this 12 as a string because a string data type is considered to be more complicated than an integer. But all these Booleans now have to get upcast to integers. And so what's going to happen is that all the trues are going to become 1 and all the falses are going to become 0. Now the, the float columns are okay. I'm just going to get 12.0 from this 12. Do you see what I did wrong? <laughs> ah! <laughs> I always have to do this wrong before I do it right. Dot loc. <laughs> uh, F1C dot loc dot five. Okay, so that's how I'm going to add a row. And now everything is totally messed up. My CEO bio column is no longer booleans. My label column is no longer integers. Um, oh, wait a minute. Oh, it's even worse than I expected because uh, by forgetting dot loc, uh, I created a column whose name was 0.5. <laughs> All right, so let's drop the F1C column 0 0.5. Uh, drop. Oh, Dell. Sorry, Dell. F one C zero point five. All right. So now that uh, now that bad column is gone. Um, but if I if I if I get rid of the row, which I do using drop, by the way. If I say f1c dot drop 0 0.5. Now, why you have to use del for a column and drop for a row? You know, we have to we have to yell at uh, at, at Wes. Uh, who knows? Yes. When you're adding rows, as long as you have all appropriate attributes, could you just use dot loc blank and it'll logically fill in what the index should be? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, you when you say blank, you mean empty empty. Yeah. Uh, I have not tried that. Let me let me do this drop example here. So th here's how I get rid of a row. I'm going to say f1c dot drop 0 0.5. Now another thing that's a, a little bit odd about the drop method is that it doesn't directly change F1C. What it does is it returns to me a copy of F1C with that particular row dropped. So if I wanted to actually change that, uh, if I wanted to actually change F1C itself, I would need to say, let's modify F1C to refer to F1C with that particular row, 0 0.5, dropped. And now I have F1C with five rows and four columns. However, the upcasting was not undone. So this is uh, quite unfortunate. There's, there's, no, there's no convenient undo when you've done an operation that wrecks your data. Um, you can't just say, no, 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 I didn't mean it. I want to undo that and get back to your Booleans for CEO by and your integers for the labels. Um, so uh, so just don't ever make any mistakes and you'll be all set. Question? Why does the point five row come after the four row? Um, because they're just added in the order that you add them. So now let's get back to the question about if I say f1 c dot loc square bracket gets uh, q is there any stock whose ticker is Q? I have no idea. No, so you do have to specify some location yourself. Um, but we have a good point here, which is that the, 
the new rows get added in the order that you add them, uh, which may be different from uh, from what you want. So I can say f1c dot loc uh, six. And now I have row six after row four. And as we saw, I could say five here. And they just get put in in the order that they're created. Okay. So the, the labels are not sorted. It's just that they're typically created initially in some sequential order. Okay? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I haven't tested this with drop. I know with uh, uh, I know for accessing a particular row, you can use either the label or the index. So if I say f f one c dot loc sub zero, I get the sub zero row. Um, actually, that's not a very good that's not very good evidence. Let me do f1c sub 5, right? Let's see whether f1c dot loc sub 5 gives me the row that's labeled 6.0. No. Fascinating. So it is converting, it is converting my integer subscript here to a floating point number to do the lookup. But in the case of labels being strings, then the integer subscripts are treated as, you know, sub zero through whatever. So S2 uh, sub two is equivalent to S2 sub and then quote C quote. Question or no, okay. All right. Um, all right, so what have we done? We've, we've looked at how to create data frames, um, either manually or frequently from uh, building a dictionary and then creating a data frame from the dictionary. We've also taken a look at how to access columns, rows, and cells. We've taken a look at how to add and delete columns and rows. Now we're going to take a look at how to do slicing uh, to get subparts of uh, data frames. All right, and so to do this, I'm going to build a fresh data frame that's not as complicated as uh, not as complicated as F1. I'm just going to use these values uh, 0 through 12. Okay, so A12 is NP dot A range 12. Okay, so we looked at that last week. And we also know about reshape. If I say A12 dot reshape, 4 comma 3, I get the same data but reshaped into a four row and three column uh, and DRA. Now I want to use that data to build a data frame so that we can practice with slicing and indexing and I can specify the data as my first argument. <clears throat> I also am going to specify the the row index labels as well as the column names. Now, in a, in a dictionary, remember that we have keys with lists of values, or, or I should say keys with iterables of values. And the keys are taken as the column names, and the iterables of values become the column values. But here, we just have an ND array 
that's got four rows and three four rows and three columns of numbers. We don't have any natural column names or any natural uh, index names. So I'm going to define the index names for the rows and the column names for the columns. Rather than manually typing this in, let me copy and paste. Okay, so A12 is just the sequence of values 0 through 11. A12 reshaped 4 by 3 is a four row, three column shaping of those 12 values. And if I specify as my index uh, R0, R1, R2, R3, so those are my rows, very uh, unimaginative, R0 for row sub 0, R1 for row sub 1. And similarly for the columns, uh, column sub 0, column sub 1, and 2, I get <coughs> a data frame that looks like uh, what I want. Okay? I have row labels, which are strings. I have column labels, which are strings, or column names, which are strings. And then I just have a bunch of integer values in these rows and columns. Okay, well we know how to look up an individual row or an individual column. We say F2 sub and the name of the column. And the column names here are strings. So F2 sub C1. We also know how to look up a row. F2 dot loc. Uh, and let's say R2. I can create a Boolean index from the entire data frame by doing a, a comparison. So if I ask for F2 mod 3, all right, F2 mod 3, all right, there's F2. If I say F2 mod 3, in every cell, I'm going to get the remainder after division by 3. So here's what F2 mod 3 looks like. And if I then say F2 mod 3 equals 0, I get this Boolean data frame where all the entries in column C0 are true and the entries elsewhere are false. I can use that Boolean data frame as an index within the data frame to specify which items within the data frame I want to modify, in this case by doing a multiplication. Okay, so F2 okay. F2 sub F2 mod 3 equals 0 is just going to be uh, Where's my mouse? Come on, mouse. There you are. Okay. Uh, the first column and the other ones are going to be uh, treated as not a number. So that when I multiply this by 2, the only ones that get ma affected, the only ones that get altered, are the values in column C sub 0. All right, so where I used to have 0, 3, 6, 9, I now have 0, 6, 12, 18, and the other columns have been unaffected by that Boolean uh, lookup in that data frame. Here I'm using row slicing. I feel like I skipped something. Did I skip something? No. No. Uh, here we're looking at slicing, and if I say F2 sub, uh, sorry, F2 dot loc, ah, now I'm remembering, okay, F2 dot loc sub R1 colon R2, well, because the, uh, because I'm slicing with strings as my beginning and end, this means from R1 up to and including R2. 
uh, as opposed to R1 up to but not including R2. So, so both R1 and R2 are going to be included in the result here. Now, if I ask for F2 sub uh, 1 colon 3, that allows me to ask for particular rows from the data frame uh, by index uh, values. So now I'm thinking F1C. Okay, so this is reminding me, if I say F1C sub, if I ask for a slice, uh, 5 colon 6, now I'm betting I get that row containing the 6.0. But no. I'm sorry? Uh, but we didn't hear. We didn't hear. By not using dot loc, I got I got to use integer indexes as row numbers. But for some reason that didn't work for F one C. Okay. Um, because these things are floats, these values are converted to floats, and it means from 5 up to but not including 6 and those are in the wrong order so if I said F1C from 6 up to and including 5 <laughs> okay all right all right so all right, so apparently if you have floating point numbers as labels, which you can do, then the integer subscripts that you're trying to use will be converted to floating point, um, which, which, which I did not know. Um, but as a general thing, you, you very seldom have you know, floating point numbers as indexes. You usually have integers or strings, or, and we haven't talked about this, you can have uh, dates and times as uh, indexes in something like a time series of values. All right, well, that's as far as I plan to get uh, today. And we'll finish babbling about pandas at the beginning of Thursday. Uh, recall that we do have a quiz on Thursday, our second quiz. The quiz will cover uh, the week two material, but not beautiful soup. And it will cover the week three material, but not NumPy. Okay, so basically you need to you need to look at like the first two thirds of the week two lecture materials and the week three lecture materials. But don't worry about NumPy, which will come in the third quiz, and don't worry about Beautiful Soup, which is just too much of a disaster for me to expect anybody to remember. All right. <clears throat> Any questions? Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll be posting those uh, in the next couple of days. Okay. Do you want um, to post, like, what dates they're all due and everything? So well, okay. Excellent question. So, so basically, we're... Uh, all right. So the, so the first couple of items were due uh, last Friday. The second item wi in which we want you to uh, collect the data that you're planning to use and show us at least a strongly representative subset of that data in spreadsheet form. Yeah. You don't have to include all of the data in the spreadsheet, just, just a good representative sample in your spreadsheet. Um, then everything else is due, um, the final pitch deck, the, uh, okay, so the final pitch deck, the code, there's something else that I've forgotten. <laughs> are due the day before the presentations. And then the presentations are due on the day of the presentations. <laughs> so everything else in the project is going to be due either, you know, either, either on uh, midnight Monday in week seven, um, or else you know, you'll give your live presentation either on Tuesday or Thursday. Uh, that's that's correct. There are there are there, there are 
there are no more draft uh, deliverables. Okay. There are only final deliverables. And you don't want our code this Saturday, do you? Pardon me? Do you want our code this Saturday? No, heavens no. I, I expect you to spend two weeks working hard on your code. All right. <laughs> Boy, if you're already done with your project, lucky no. you. <laughs> Any other questions? Okie doke. I will see you on Thursday.